Yes, so I started recording now, and so from time to time um, I will just stop the recording and start again so that I get little video segments, and when I play it back, as well as being able to see how I'm doing, I can also see how you're doing. I can see who is on their smartphone, who is asleep. I can see all of these things. So uh, this just gives you a little bit of an incentive to stay awake. Now, the title of my presentation is The Impact of Disruptive Digital Technologies on Medicine, Health and Wellbeing. And I'm going to be talking about my, some of my thoughts and ideas about what the future holds. But before I start, I would like to ask you something. Um, I would like you to forget that you are life scientists, but remember that you are human beings. Because I'm making this presentation not as a life scientist, I'm an information technologist. My, my background and my expertise is in uh, the impact of digital technologies. So it's not specific to medicine. So I've been very impressed by all of the presentations that I've seen so far, the wonderful speakers, people who dedicated their lives to learning about how the human body works so that they can make the world a better and healthier places. But the reality is, because my background is not in medicine, I don't understand most of the words that they use. Okay, so it's a different language. So the good thing for you today is, if you speak English, is that we will be talking the same language because I'm talking as a human being, I'm sharing experiences that you all will have had in your lives and that you will face in the future. So these are my objectives. I'm going to look at how digital technologies are going to impact the future of medicine, health and well-being. I'm going to talk about what I think are the most significant digital technologies, what their likely impact is going to be, and how the study of digital medicine can shape a sustainable future for the stakeholders in medicine, health and well-being. Because, as you will see in this presentation, things are changing very, very quickly. And the world that you will go to work in will be very different to the world today. And some of those changes will be really challenging for people who want to build a career in medicine. Now, uh, Joe talked about some of the devices that he's seeing as a cardiologist, and he has already seen that some of these devices are able to produce results that at least match the abilities of a human being and before long will overtake the capabilities of a human being. And that has a real profound implication for anybody working in the medical profession. So I'm going to talk about, really, it's a story about the future of two children. One of these children um, you see there in 1950, and you'll notice that I still have the same hairstyle as I had in 1950. Um, and this, is my, this was my toy, my plaything in those days. Um, and now you see a child of today's generation with the iPad and the, the laptop. So I'm going to look through the lens of technologies. I'm going to talk about how technology affected the way my life developed and I'm going to ask you to think very carefully about how technology will affect not only your life, but more importantly, the lives of the coming generations. So, just very quickly, and this I think, I'm putting this on the screen here because this is the kind of progression that my parents wanted for me. My parents wanted me to have a better life than they had. So they wanted me to go to school, uh, to pass the exams and go to university, and they wanted me to have a professional career. My father was a carpenter. You know, he made uh, coffins, among other things, that people are buried in. Um, he didn't want me to do the same thing. He wanted me to have a different career, a professional career. He wanted me to have a job for life with security and good income. 
He wanted me to be healthy and strong with a responsible job that earned status and respect. So these are the kind of jobs that my mother and father had in mind. They would have loved me to be a doctor or a teacher or a bank manager, uh, a, a professional job. Um, so they tried to do their best to give me the opportunities to have one of these careers. And I, I should just tell you very quickly, one of the reasons why my family wanted me to be a doctor. Because as I mentioned, my father was a carpenter, so he made coffins that people were buried in when they die. My uncle was a preacher, so he could marry people. Uh, and my uncle wanted me to be a doctor so that I could bring babies into the world. So we would have a family business I could bring babies into the world, my uncle could marry them, and my father could bury them. Um, and I even had a name, which uh, you may not understand some of the words, but the name of this business was going to be Hatch, which is bringing people into the world, Match, marrying them, and Dispatch, sending them away. So these are the kind of attributes for the kind of job they wanted me to have. Um, you need to have subject matter knowledge, you need to be responsible, have judgment, ability to analyse information, uh, experience. All of these things demand years of training, dedication and skills development. So to be a doctor, uh, you needed to have at least five years at university and then experience in a, in a teaching hospital before you were allowed to have practice. And the same is true for all of those jobs. They required you to spend years of your own time. Now, what about me? You know, what did I want to do when I was a young child? I wanted a job. I had a great job in mind. I really knew what I wanted to do. And it was a job that provided great training. It required years of training. Uh, and it was a career based on using my brains, judgment, experience and skills. It was a job for life, as I thought. It provided security and good income. It gave me opportunity to travel, which I still love to do today, responsible, and it held status and respect. I'm not going to tell you what that job is until a little bit later in the presentation. So when I look at my, back at my life, I'm now 69 years old, I can have a look at the tick list of the things that my parents had in mind and what actually happened. So it's a pretty good, full of ticks. The only things where I put a cross against, and I'll just play, explain why, is I didn't have a job for life. I went to university to be an electrical engineer and I finished up doing something completely different. So I started with the, with the idea that I would build my career in one organisation doing one type of work. It didn't happen. And today I work for myself. I'm a freelance consultant. So I don't have security. You know, it depends on me being able to sell my services to other people. Uh, and consequently, um, I don't have as good an income as a professor at a university, for example, because I rely on my pension and anything that I can earn from uh, my, my travels. So, how did I do against my parents' wish list? Well, they wanted to be a doctor. I'm a vice president of the International Society of Digital Medicine. So I think that is a pretty good uh, achievement. They wanted, I could have been a teacher. I was a keynote speaker at an international conference on technology enhanced learning, which was attended by teachers. And I've been a speaker at a bank tech organization in Asia. So all, in all of these areas, I've had achievements where people regard me as having something worthwhile to say about those professions. Now, that would never have been possible or imaginable when I was a child. It's only something that has happened as a result of developments in technology. So, just going back to my dream job, anybody got any idea what my dream job would like to be? <laughs> I read the Oh, you've read the book. Okay, well, I, I will show you. This is my dream job. I wanted to drive a steam train. 
That was my dream. It provided all of those things. But of course, um, if I had been a train driver, today, trains have no drivers. So I would have no job, right? Now, you do see trains with drivers. Uh, you know, I go on the bullet train. I go on fast trains in the UK. But they are... what. The demands of a, a driver of one of these trains are nothing like as demanding as a steam train driver. You just sit there and the technology does it for you. So it's a totally different kind of job. And it doesn't give, I believe, the same kind of job satisfaction as you would have driving a steam train. So when I look at the way technology has changed in my lifetime, this is a, an enabling technology uh, timeline. So in 1950, all of these pictures are accurate from 1950. Uh, the car that you see at the top there is my uncle's car. Um, it's a Humber Snipe. He was the only man in our street who had a car. Nobody had cars. Very few people had cars in those days. My uncle had one, and seven of us used to get in this car to go to the seaside. You know, my uncle and my auntie and my two cousins and me and my mum and dad, seven of us in that car. Uh, the, the public transport, the, the tra steam trains provided the public transport. We, instead of Google or Baidu or Bing, um, I had the Encyclopedia Britannica to learn from. Um, the telephones looked like that. Um, and um, the television sets, we didn't have a television set till I was five. They looked like that. They were very tiny and they were black and white and they weren't on 24 hours a day. They were only on for a few hours every day. So that was what it was like when I was young. Now, if you fast forward 40 years, you go from cars, there's a, a mini, there's a diesel train, there's a, a, a mobile phone and a, a CD-ROM, um, and the television set of the days 40 years later. Not much change, really. Not much change. Technology has not really had that much impact on those devices. But you, even shorter time scale, 30 years, what do we see now? Robot-driven cars. You don't need a driver. The robot drives the car. Trains without drivers. This is a picture, an actual picture from the um, Kuala Lumpur mass rapid transport system. You can, the kids sit at the front um, and they can pretend to be train drivers now because they sat where the driver would be. So, um, and, and then at the bottom there, instead of the television, we've got devices like the iPads. You can watch the movies on, on a plane or, or, or anywhere. So, remarkable improvements in that 30 years. So it's a time of exponential change. Uh, this was a chart by Ray Kurzweil, and it's intending to show how technology, uh, in terms of its computational power, um, is going from uh, the power of one insect brain to one mouse brain to one human brain to eventually all human brains. And it's a logarithmic scale. And we've already, I believe, passed the one human brain mark, and we're well on the way to all human brains. So it's a logarithmic plot. So what does it mean for anybody who's going into a profession, whether it's a teacher or a doctor, um, whatever profession you're going into, you are entering a period of exponential change. And you're going from a situation where professionals, when I was a, a child, were the keepers and users of knowledge. They were the people who had the knowledge, they used it, and they earned a living. Today, if you're a teacher, you can't possibly know everything. If you're a doctor, you can't possibly know everything. And so you have a different role in your life. And so, just as an illustration, um, and I... It's just a, maybe a little bit of a digression, but um, I was in Qingdao a few days ago. And at this presentation, which was talking about making Qingdao a capital of oceanography, one of the presenters used a video. Uh, and it was an aerial video. I'd like just to play it to you. Uh, it, it doesn't take very long. It uh, lasts a minute. 
So just have a look at this video, and um, at the end of it, I'm going to ask you whether you'd like to go to Xingdao if you've never been to Xingdao. So the lovely sea, some entertainment. I, I, I did like the uh, the big wheel in, in Qingdao. I, I got quite attracted to that. So I want you to think about, now if I was going to do this, what would I need to make that video? And how much would it cost me? And how long would it take? Well, I'm going to show you now. I'll just wait for it to finish. It's nearly... Uh, coming to its close. Some nice relaxing sounds of the waves that I really liked. Okay, so you see that video. So what do I need to make that video? I need a helicopter, right? I need a helicopter and I need a trained cameraman. Somebody who's very good sitting on the edge of the helicopter making a stable video. I need somebody to get, uh, to be a director to actually um, decide what's going to be shot and where it's going to be. Uh, and it needs all of these things. It needs skill and experience. It needs communication between these experts. It needs collaboration. It needs a equipment hire. And it needs all to be put together. So any idea how much thousands of you won? Yeah? Well, no. This is how it was done. It was done with a drone, a smartphone, a controller, and the laptop that I had on my desk here. So I did everything with just those tools. But those tools had artificial intelligence. The drone had to be able to be controlled from the ground and had to be stable and all of these things were built in with artificial intelligence into that device so the jobs of the helicopter pilot the cameraman the rest of it were all built into that drone so i didn't need to use all those people i could just do it myself with six weeks practice okay so just make you think and you and even if I had the helicopter and the camera and the rest of it, they could not produce a picture like that. It would be impossible for them to uh, produce a picture like that. That is a panoramic, a 360 degree picture from the air. And if anybody wants to have a look at it, I bought my virtual reality headset that you see there. I bought that with me and I'd be happy to show you some virtual reality uh, pictures afterwards. So think about another team situation where you have a surgeon, you have experts, all monitoring the condition of the patient, looking after them, doing things together. They've got exactly the same kind of skills, expertise, communication, collaboration. All these same things are exactly the same as what I would have had to have used a few years ago to make an aerial video. So the, looking at the, the technologies um, that we're talking about here, you've got artificial intelligence, uh, you've got uh, personal robots, you've got robotic surgery, uh, you've got uh, a serious game with a laparoscopy uh, to train people on how to take out, uh, for example, a gallstone. Um, you've got virtual reality, wearable devices, cloud uh, computing. Um, you've got the Internet of Things. Uh, you've got 360 degree virtual reality. Um, you've got 3D printing, which is being used to create artificial limbs today. And you've got social media. All of these things are going to impact your profession. So when you look at what digital technologies can do and what they're good at and what in some cases they are better than humans at, they measure and monitor. Joe showed some very good examples of the devices that you wear to measure your cardiac functions. They analyse that data and inform it, and they visualise it so that you can understand what you're seeing. They're able to use that data to predict as well. And they can connect and collaborate with other people. 
And in the future, what we will see is that more and more, these technologies will come together and control what happens in your body. So those are some of the technologies. I want to just try and um, distill uh, this into something that I will communicate what I see as the most important trends. Uh, this is a graph uh, that on the bottom axis you have uh, the type of technology uh, and it goes from very dumb technologies that are isolated, that are proprietary, that are developed for a specific purpose. And at the other end, you get generic smart technologies like your smartphone that are used for many different things. They're connected and collaborative, and they've got lots of hardware and software. And on the y-axis, you're going from uh, the, the effectively the, the person using that technology is going from the clinician uh, for diagnosis and treatment to the citizen uh, managing their own treatment. So it actually is a three-dimensional graph. So this is what I believe is happening, is a technology is going from uh, technology that's designed specifically for one purpose to something that can be used for many different things. Uh, technology is going from clinician uh, solutions to citizen solutions, and it's going from acute medical uh, conditions to treating chronic medical conditions, which are some of the most uh, important conditions facing society today. And for any new technology and any new application, you can map these in three dimensions. So what does that mean for the future? Well, the technologies that we are talking about, this technology, my drone, uh, my smartphone, the devices that Joe showed, they are coming down to be consumer technologies. So these consumer technologies mean that you will, cre you will have, if you're a medical profession, you will have competition from non-medical professionals. Robotic surgery, I think, will become more commonplace. And I believe that we're not too far away from diagnosis being, being entirely digital. And I think in future, we're likely to see that our lifestyle conditions are managed digitally. So if you've got diabetes, for example, you will have an embedded device that will monitor your glucose levels, uh, connect to an insulin pump, and, 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 and provide you with insulin at the right time. So that raises some questions in, in, in my mind. Um, I think that, uh, as we're finding with uh, medical insurance, uh, the medical insurers need to know as much of you about you as possible. As Joe indicated, they, are, uh, they will pay for the diagnosis because it will save them money in the long time if it stops you getting ill. Uh, and I think people will be encouraged to share their medical data in the future in a form of contract. So if we go back to the medical professional job attributes, they're exactly the same as the kind of attributes for the job that my... Uh, parents had in mind for me, uh, but do these jobs in the future, will they depend on machine intelligence combined with human empathy? So the doctor will not be the person who does everything and knows everything and prescribes everything. The technology will do that and the doctor will be there to have a relationship with the patient and to help them to comply with whatever medication is required. So, these are the kind of questions that we have to ask ourselves when digital technologies and artificial intelligence can, and they will, diagnose and fix problems better than humans, and ro robots operate more precisely than surgeons, what does that mean for the future? This is my girlfriend. Okay. This is my girlfriend. Uh, this was shot in Kuala Lumpur um, at a medical conference um, and she is playing a surgical game and she is removing a gallstone. So using lap laparoscopy um, and, and she's, it's a competition so she's marked on, on the accuracy of uh, her work and the time it takes to perform the procedure so she gets a score. And surprise, surprise, particularly for me, because um, 
my girlfriend Jackie is not a technology person at all. She doesn't like computers. She never plays video games, but she was getting better results than some trainee surgeons. So you have to ask the question is if you're going to hospital for a major operation, are you better to be operated on by a trainee surgeon who's maybe not that good, or my girlfriend who's pretty good at laparoscopy? It's something to think about, uh, but it also means, and this is a picture of a, a real surgeon wearing a VR headset. Uh, it's um, uh, a cancer surgeon in the UK called Professor Shafi Ahmed, um, and he performed the first virtual reality surgical operation. So he performed an actual operation which was filmed using camera a bit more sophisticated than this one so that there were thousands of people around the world who could be in the operating theatre with him witnessing the operation as he saw it. So that's a tremendous advance. But what does it mean for the future? It means that surgeons like Shafi Ahmed with a virtual reality headset he could operate from uh, London on a patient here in Beijing. Yeah, because of the speed of the communications, uh, it's, it's possible. And many of these things will come to pass. So when we look in the, in the future, Ray Kurzweil, who, who produced the exponential change graph, um, he believed in something called the singularity. And the singularity is where human beings and technology blend together. Uh, so it's shown like a robot. I don't think we will be looking like that in 30 years. But the point is that we will have all kinds of devices embedded in us, monitoring our condition, helping us uh, with, uh, to, to stay healthy in, in our lives. This is something maybe not to look forward to. <laughs> So how do we um, build a sustainable future? Um, what's going to happen? Uh, well, uh, wearable consumer devices like this one, I mean, it's a primitive version. It measures my steps, it measures my sleep. I've used this over the past six years, or devices like this. When I started using it, um, I used the data to learn about uh, diet and exercise. And so every day for the last six years, uh, I've walked five miles, at least five miles. And I've only missed about six or seven days in all that time. Um, and that's when I've been traveling long distances. I think inevitably we are going to have healthcare costs linked to lifestyle behaviors. So if you don't look after yourself, you will have to pay more for your treatment. People will have to accept respons more responsibility for their own health. And I believe this is what your, your president also believes in, is a long-term health plan. So we're going to see a revolution in the healthcare e ecosystem. Um, and we're going to see a growth in embedded devices that only monitor our health but also control it. So, uh, in summary, in conclusion, um, digital technologies are going to have a massive impact on health professionals across all sectors. And medical professionals will face competition from non-traditional sources. And digital technologies, I think, will need to, to target preventative uh, medicine, preventative health care, um, and be used to impact the lifestyles that we live because lifestyle-related conditions are the biggest cause of mortality today. Um, and I think it's not these um, advanced MRI and other devices that are being developed at the moment, excellent though they are, important though they are, uh, I think it's likely to be more like consumer-driven technologies that are likely to be have the biggest influence on the future of digital medicine. So thank you very much. Um, um, and I, if you, if I just got, I have just got a couple of minutes left, so I would just like to show you this very quickly. This is in 360 degrees, so I'm using my finger to move the picture around. And if you are wearing the headset that I've got, you will be able to turn around 
and you will be able to see all round the uh, Forbidden City and uh, a few in about 30 seconds or so you may even see yourselves on this video. This was a gentleman I, I met at the welcome reception so you know maybe you were there. Um, here we are at the convention centre Can we turn the volume up at all? Um, it should, you should be able to hear them, him speaking. So we have um, little excerpts from the, the speeches and again, I can look round to see who is in the audience, who is paying attention, who is asleep. It's a Chinese uh, presenter, um, and then we have the uh, the actual opening. And the sound is 360 degrees as well, so with the virtual reality headset, as you look round, the sound will go round. And this is me doing some tourism. Okay, to Burzenes Stadium. Last night at the dinner, uh, the, the players. And here we are. Xiao Zhang. Chen. Thank you very much.